Hello, everyone. Before starting our class, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Huan Jinglang. I work in the Department of Laboratory Medicine, the first affiliated hospital of Fujian Medical University. And this is my email address. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Today, we are going to talk about serum cardiac markers, an important part of blood chemistry. Okay, now let's get started with a case. Who is this man here? Anyone can tell me his name? Yeah, he is Bill Clinton. He used to be the president of America, and he is also a patient of acute myocardial infarction. To deal with acute myocardial infarction, he had undertaken two cardiac operations. One was heart bypass surgery in 24, and the other was intracondral stent implantation in 2010. Okay, now here comes the question. If you are the doctor in charge of Clinton, and now he has a severe chest pain, what test will you order for him? Through this class, your guys can answer this question. The slide here shows the general outline for this class. Firstly, I will give a brief introduction of cardiac diseases, then show you the definition of serum cardiac markers. Then, we will learn lots of enzymes and proteins useful in cardiac diseases. In the end, we will take acute myocardial infarction and heart failure as two typical cardiac diseases to further clarify the differences between these markers, and how to use these markers to help us diagnose AMI and heart failure. Okay, now let's take a glance at the first part, cardiac diseases. Cardiac diseases consist of acute coronary artery syndrome, congestive heart failure, and myocarditis. Acute coronary artery syndrome consists of unstable angina and acute myocardial infarction. Here, we should pay attention to two important abbreviations. One is acute myocardial infarction. We often call it AMI for short, and the other is CHF. CHF is short for congestive heart failure. In this lesson, we will focus on these two common cardiac diseases, AMI and CHF. The basis of unstable angina and AMI is atherosclerosis. Here, I will show you a video about the formation of atherosclerosis. Let's watch it. Atherosclerosis is a disease in which fatty material is deposited on the wall of an artery. Normally, the walls of an artery are smooth, allowing blood to flow unimpeded. However, if damage occurs to its inner lining, fat, cholesterol, platelets, and other substances may accumulate at the damaged section of the arterial wall. Eventually, the tissue builds up and a plaque is formed, narrowing the lumen of the artery. Where the narrowing is severe, there is a risk that the vessel can become blocked completely if a thrombus forms in the diseased segment. From the video, we can see that the first change of these two diseases is the development of a plaque in the wall of an artery. The plaques here consist of cholesterol lipids together with inflammatory cells. The majority of plaques do not cause problems. Some of you here may have small plaques in your vessels, but it doesn't matter. However, if the plaque grows and reduces the diameter of the artery by more than 70%, it can significantly reduce the blood flow. If the plaque with fibrous cap ruptures, a blood clot will form around the rupture. Then, the artery is blocked. Rupture of the plaque leads to the seizure of unstable angina, which immediately proceeds an AMI. Both unstable angina and AMI can produce chest pain at rest, leads to specific changes in electrocardiogram and a mild or severe release of enzymes and proteins into the blood. And these enzymes and proteins are called serial cardiac markers, which are the main character of our lesson today. As for congestive heart failure, it's seen in cardiomyopathies and valve diseases. CHF is a disease that weakens the heart muscle, causes stiffening of the heart muscles, increases oxygen demand by the body tissue beyond the capability of the heart to deliver. Nowadays, cardiac diseases have become one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Therefore, diagnosis of cardiac diseases is of great importance. To better know the diagnosis of cardiac diseases, we should firstly know the definition of serial cardiac markers. An ideal biomarker for cardiac disease must be of high specificity. It can rise rapidly and last for a relatively long period. The detection method should be simple, convenient, and rapid. Importantly, the clinical value is confirmed. These four points are the characteristics of ideal biomarkers. As we all know, cardiac diseases, such as unstable angina, AMI, and CHF, can lead to an injury of heart muscle cells. When the myocardial is injured, the enzymes and the proteins will leak out from the cells into the blood. Thus, their concentrations in the blood increase. The level of these enzymes and proteins can indicate the damage of cardiac muscles. In other words, the damage is more severe, the level of these enzymes and proteins is higher. So, by detecting the level of these enzymes and proteins, we can know whether the patient has a damage to cardiac muscle or not, whether the damage is severe or not. And these enzymes and proteins are called serial cardiac markers. According to the definition, serial cardiac markers can be divided into two parts, enzymes and proteins. First, let's turn to the enzymes useful in myocardial diseases. The enzymes consist of creatine kinase and its ethyl enzymes, and lactose dehydrogenase and its ethyl enzymes. CK is short for creatine kinase. CK and its ethyl enzymes include CK and CKMB. LDH is short for lactose dehydrogenase. LDH ethyl enzymes include LD1 to LD5. 
Now, we will learn these enzymes one by one. The first one is CK. CK is located in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. The expression of CK is formed in various tissues, including cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, brain, and smooth muscle. So, it's not only specific for cardiac muscle. A damage of skeletal muscle or just strenuous exercise can also lead to the increased level of CK. CK functions in muscle cells to catalyze the convention of creatine and consumes ATP to create phosphocreatine and ADP. The reference interval for CK varies with different detection methods. If CK is detected by enzyme coupled method at 37 degrees, the reference interval for adult male is 38 to 174 units per liter, and for female is 26 to 140 units per liter. Your guys don't need to remember these values. These two pictures shows the machines used in our department to detect CK. The left one is Lowe's Cobalt P800. It used a velocity method to detect CK. The right one is brought from Johnson & Johnson Company. It used an enzymatic method to detect CK. CK is an indicator for detection of damage to cardiac and skeletal muscles. It's increased in myocardial infarction, myocarditis, and muscle trauma. Hypothyroidism and home therapy result in decreased level of CK. This curve here shows the change of CK concentration with the time of onset per AMI. CK starts to increase 3 to 8 hours per AMI, reach the peak 10 to 36 hours, and then falls to normal range 72 to 96 hours after AMI. CK consists of two subunits, M subunit and B subunit. This enables three possible SO enzymes, CKMM, CKMB, and CKBB. CKMM is mainly expressed in skeletal muscles and myocardia. CKMB is mainly expressed in myocardia and the CKBB is nearly formed in all the tissues at low levels. So, which one do you think is more specific for cardiac diseases? The answer is CKMB. The reference interval of CKMB depends on the detection method. It's less than 5% of total CK by electrophoresis, and less than 50 units per liter by immunoinhibition. The normal range for CKMB mass is less than 5 microgram per liter. Increased level of CKMB is observed in patients with AMI, myocardial injury, myopathies, and surgery. As for AMI, CKMB begins to rise 3 to 8 hours after onset of chest pain, reach peak level 9 to 30 hours, and falls to normal range 2 to 3 days after infection. Okay, now let's come to another important enzyme, LDH. LDH is mainly distributed in cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, kidney, and also red blood cells. So from the tissue distribution, we can see that LDH is also not specific for cardiac diseases. Damage of skeletal muscle can also lead to the increased level of LDH. And here we should pay attention to red blood cells. Red blood cells contain relatively high level of LDH. So here comes the question. Is a hemolytic blood sample suitable for the detection of LDH? The answer is no. When red blood cell ruptures, LDH will leak out into the blood, and the serial level of LDH will increase. So, a hemolytic blood sample cannot be used for the detection of LDH. LDH functions to catalyze the interconversion of pyruvate and lactate, an important step in glycolysis. For patients with AMI, LDH starts to increase 8 to 18 hours after onset of pain, reaches the peak 24 to 72 hours, and lasts for a relatively long time. After about 6 to 10 days, the level of LDH falls to normal range. So, from the curve here, LDH can be used for the late diagnosis of AMI. Here, what is late diagnosis of AMI? For example, if you are the doctor and now a patient comes to see you and tell you that he had a severe chest pain a week ago. If you suspect him to be a patient of AMI, you can order the test of LDH. Because at that time, CK, CKMB has already forced to normal range, but the level of LDH is still high after a week. So, LDH can be used for the late diagnosis of AMI. LDH is a catchment of H and M subunit. This enables five possible SO enzymes. LD1 consists of 4H subunit. LD2 consists of 3H and 1M subunit. Both LD1 and LD2 are mainly expressed in the heart. LD3 contains 2H and 2M subunit, and is frequently expressed in the lung and the spleen. LD4 consists of 1H and 3M subunit. For LD5, there is 4M subunit. Both LD4 and LD5 are mostly formed in liver and striated muscles. According to the tissue distribution, which one do you think is more specific for cardiac diseases? The answer is LD1 and LD2, because LD1 and LD2 are more relevant with cardiac diseases. Clinically, we often use the ratio LD1-LD2 to help us diagnose cardiac diseases. The reference interval for a LD1-LD2 ratio is less than 0.85. The level of LD1 and LD2 is increased in patients with AMI, and the LD1-LD2 ratio is always over 0.85. Meanwhile, the increased level of LD5 is seen in patients with liver diseases. 
Okay, now let's make a short summary for all the enzymes we have learned about. We have learned four kinds of enzymes. They are CK, CKMB, LDH, and the ratio LD1, LD2. Next, let's turn to the proteins used for in cardiac diseases. There are mainly five kinds of proteins involved in cardiac diseases. Troponins, myoglobin, hard fatty acid bonding protein, B, natural red egg peptide, we can also call it BNP for short. And the last one is a terminal below BNP, we can also call it NT pro BNP. First, let's take a glance at troponins. Troponin is a regulatory protein complex and consists of three acyl types, troponin T, troponin C, and troponin I. Troponin T binds the troponin complex to tropomyosin. Troponin I functions to inhibit actomyosin ATPase. Troponin C regulates the activity of troponin I. First, troponin T and troponin I are mainly expressed in myocyte. They are cardiac-specific markers. The reference interval is 0.02 to 0.13 microgram per liter for troponin T. And for troponin I, it's less than 0.2 microgram per liter. The level of troponin T and troponin I is increased in patients with myocardial infarction, minor myocardial damage, and cardiac trauma and surgery. Here, you guys should pay attention to the minor myocardial damage. Only troponin T and troponin I can be used as markers for minor myocardial damage. For patients with AMI, the level of troponin T and troponin I begin to rise rapidly, only 3 to 6 hours after onset of pain. It takes 10 to 24 hours for troponin T to reach the peak. And both troponin T and troponin I can last for a long time. Troponin I can last for almost 7 days, and for troponin T, it can last for a longer time, about 15 days. Therefore, both troponin T and troponin I can be used for the late diagnosis of AMI. Okay, now let's come to the next protein, myoglobin. Myoglobin is a low molecular weight protein. It's expressed in myocardial tissues and skeletal muscles, so its specificity is not so good for cardiac diseases. Myoglobin is an oxygen-binding protein, serves as a reserve for oxygen and facilitates the movement of oxygen within muscle cells. The reference interval for myoglobin is 50 to 85 microgram per liter by ELISA, 6 to 85 microgram per liter by RRA. Increased level of myoglobin is seen in patients with myocardial infarction, skeletal muscle damage, acute or chronic renal failure. Okay, here comes the question, why does the level of myoglobin increase in patients with renal failure? Anyone knows the answer? Because myoglobin is mainly eliminated by kidney. For patients with AMI, myoglobin increases rapidly. It only takes about half an hour to two hours. The level of myoglobin reaches the peak 5 to 12 hours and falls to the normal range 18 to 30 hours per AMI. Therefore, myoglobin can be used for early diagnosis of AMI. And here, what is early diagnosis of AMI? For example, a patient had a chest pain at home and he lived near the hospital. It takes him only half an hour to go to the hospital and see the doctor. At that time, you should choose myoglobin because at that time only myoglobin is elevated and other markers are normal. So, myoglobin can be used for the early diagnosis of AMI. Okay, the next protein is fatty acid bonding protein. We can also call it FABP for short. FABP functions to uptake and intercellular transport of the long-chain fatty acids in cardiomyocytes. The reference interval for FABP is less than 5 microgram per liter. FABP is mainly distributed in myocardial tissues, skeletal muscle, and also kidney. From the tissue distribution, we can see that increased level of FABP is seen in patients with myocardial infarction, skeletal muscle damage, and also acute or chronic renal failure. For patients with AMI, FABP starts to elevate half an hour to three hours after onset of pain and falls quickly. It takes only 12 to 24 hours for FABP to fall into normal range. So, FABP can also be used for the early diagnosis of AMI. Now, let's look at the last important protein markers for heart failure, BNP and NT-pro-BNP. Firstly, I will show you the generate of BNP and NT-pro-BNP. The BNP gene is located in chromosome 1. The BNP gene is transcribed and then translated to generate a protein with 108 amino acids called pro-BNP. Then, an enzyme divides the pro-BNP into two parts. One contains 1 to 76 amino acids called N-terminal pro-BNP, namely NT-pro-BNP. The other part contains 77 to 108 amino acids called BNP. Both BNP and NT-pro-BNP are secreted by ventricular myocardia. When the wall tension increased, ventricular myocardia will secrete BNP and NT-pro-BNP. BNP functions to inhibit the RAAS and SNS system. The half-life of BNP is short, only 20 minutes. BNP can be eliminated by three ways, combined with clearance receptor, neutral endopeptidase, and renal excretion. For NT-pro-BNP, to date, researchers haven't found any physiological function. The half-life of NT-pro-BNP is longer than BNP. It can be stable for 120 minutes. NT-pro-BNP can only be eliminated by renal excretion. So, here comes the question. For patients with both heart failure and renal failure, which marker is better, BNP or NT-pro-BNP? 
The answer is BNP, because anti-pro-BNP can only be eliminated by renal excretion. So the level of anti-pro-BNP will significantly increase in patients with renal failure. But for BNP, it can be eliminated by other two ways except for renal excretion. The reference interval for BNP is less than 100 picogram per microliter. For anti-pro-BNP, the reference interval varies with the age. When the age is less than 75, it's less than 125 picogram per microliter. When the patient's age is over 75, the reference interval is less than 450 picogram per microliter. These two pictures show the machines used in our department to detect BNP. Increased level of BNP and anti-pro-BNP is seen in patients with congestive heart failure, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, AMI, and renal failure. Both BNP and anti-pro-BNP are clinically used for the diagnosis, monitoring, and prognosis of CHF. This table summarizes the differences between BNP and anti-pro-BNP. And this table is very important. You guys should memorize this table. Okay, now let's make a short summary for proteins used for in cardiac diseases. We have learned six proteins. They are chopping T, chopping I, myoglobin, FABP, BNP, and anti-pro-BNP. Chopping T, chopping I, myoglobin, and FABP are used for markers for AMI, and BNP and anti-pro-BNP are markers for heart failure. However, how to use these markers to help us diagnose disease? Take AMI as an example. According to the WHO, the diagnosis of AMI is defined by clinical signs and symptoms, specific changes in ECG, and also elevated serial enzymes and proteins, including CK, CKMB, LDH, LDHSL enzymes, myoglobin, FABP, and chopnins. Since there are so many markers used for, for AMI, how to choose them? This figure shows the level of cardiac markers with a time after onset of AMI. For early diagnosis, let's look at this region. The markers which increase rapidly can be used for early diagnosis for AMI. From the picture, myoglobin, the red line here, firstly increase. So, myoglobin can be used for early diagnosis of AMI. For late diagnosis, we should pay attention to this region. The markers which last for a longer time can be used for late diagnosis. They are LDH, the gray line, and chopping T, chopping I. To better understand this, let's look at this table. This table lays the time needed for the markers to increase, reach the peak, and normalization. We can see that myoglobin and FABP are the two markers increase more rapidly than others, so they can be used for early diagnosis of AMI. LDH, LD1, chopping T, chopping I can last for a relatively long time to fall to normal range, so these four markers can be used for the late diagnosis of AMI. For definitive diagnosis, we should pay attention to the specificity. CKMB, chopping T, and chopping I have a relatively high specificity, so these three markers can be used for the definitive diagnosis of AMI. Now let's make a short summary. For early diagnosis, we can choose myoglobin and FABP. For definitive diagnosis, we can choose chopping T, chopping I, and CKMB. For late diagnosis, we can choose chopping T, chopping I, and LDH. Okay, let's back to the case of Bill Clinton. What laboratory test would be helpful for diagnosis? CK, CKMB, LDH, LDH, ethyl enzymes, chopping T, chopping I, myoglobin, and also FABP. These tests are all helpful. If he had chest pain for more than two days, which test is better? We can choose the markers that are useful for the late diagnosis of AMI. We can choose LDH, LDH, ethyl enzymes, chopping T, and chopping I. If he had chest pain just half an hour ago, which test is better? At this time, we should choose markers useful for the early diagnosis of AMI. We can choose myoglobin and FABP. In the end, I will show you how to use cardiac markers to diagnose CHF. What test would be helpful for diagnosis of CHF? X-ray, ECG, ultrasonic cardiogram, and also laboratory test, BNP and NT-pro-BNP. If the BNP level is less than 100 picogram per microliter, 90% of the patients do not suffer from CHF. If BNP level is between 100 to 400 picogram per microliter, the patient may suffer from CHF. The doctors should combine with symptoms to make the diagnosis. If the level of BNP is over 400 picogram per microliter, 90% of the patient is suffering CHF. For anti-pro-BNP, the procedure for diagnosis is similar. If the anti-pro-BNP is less than 400 picogram per microliter, 90% of the patients do not suffer from CHF. If anti-pro-BNP level is between 400 to 2,000 picogram per microliter, the patient may suffer from CHF. The doctors should combine with clinical symptoms to make the diagnosis. If the level of anti-pro-BNP is more than 2,000 picogram per microliter, 90% of the patient is suffering CHF. Okay, finally, for serum cardiac markers, much has already been done. However, much is still left to be done. We hope coming years would be fruitful in evaluating new cardiac markers. 
Let's make a final summary for today's lesson. First, we have learned the definition of serum cardiac markers. Cardiac markers are enzymes and proteins leak out into the blood. Their level can indicate the damage of myocardial. Then, we have learned enzymes useful in cardiac diseases, including CK, CKMB, LDH, and the ratio LD1, LD2. We have already learned some proteins useful in cardiac diseases, including chopping T, chopping I, myoglobin, FABP, BNP, and also NT-pro BNP. In the end, we take AMI and CHF as two examples to show the application of these markers in clinical. For early diagnosis of AMI, we can choose myoglobin and FABP. For definitive diagnosis, we can choose chopping T, chopping I, and CKMB. For late diagnosis, we can choose chopping T, chopping I, and LDH. For diagnosis of CHF, we can choose BNP and NT-pro BNP to help diagnosis. Here are some exercises. We will do it together. Among these five cardiac markers, which one can be used for the diagnosis, therapy, and the prognosis of heart failure? The answer is BNP. Other markers, CKMV, chopping T, chopping I, and FABP, are always used for the diagnosis of AMI. For definitive diagnosis of AMI, which one is best? For definitive diagnosis of AMI, we can choose Chopnings and also CKMB, but the best one is Chopnings, so we should choose B. For early diagnosis of AMI, which one is the best? The answer is C. Myoglobin and FABP can be used for the early diagnosis of AMI. Which acid enzyme or LDH increases most rapidly after AMI? The answer is LD1. Which cardiac marker can be used to detect minor myocardial damage? Only chopnings can be used to detect minor myocardial damage, so the answer is B. Which cardiac marker has the smallest molecular weight? The answer is C, myoglobin. How many subunits does CK have? CK has two subunits, M subunit and B subunit. How many acyl enzymes does CK have? CK has three acyl enzymes, CKMM, CKMB, and CKBB. How many subunits does LDH have? LDH is a tetramer. It contains four subunits. How many acyl enzymes does LDH have? LDH have five kinds of acyl enzymes, LD1 to LD5. What are the differences between BNP and NT-pro BNP? The molecular weight of BNP is 3.5 kg. It contains 32 amino acids. For NT-pro BNP, the molecular weight is 8.5 kg, and it contains 76 amino acids. BNP functions to inhibit the RAS and SNS system. However, researchers haven't found any physiological functions for NT-pro BNP. BNP has a shorter half-life than NT-pro BNP. For BNP, the half-life is 20 minutes. For NT-pro BNP, it's 120 minutes. BNP can be eliminated by three ways, NEP, clearance receptor, and renal excretion. However, for NT-pro BNP, it can only be eliminated by renal excretion. BNP can keep stable for 4 hours at 25 degrees. For NT-pro BNP, it can keep stable for more than 72 hours at 25 degrees. Both BNP and NT-pro BNP increase with patient age. The cutoff value of BNP for CHF is 100 picogram per microliter. For NT-pro BNP, the cutoff value varies with different patient age. If the age is less than 75, the cutoff value is 125 picogram per microliter. If the patient age is over 75, the cutoff value is 450 picogram per microliter. In the end, I will show you some useful Chinese phrases. For cardiac markers, we can call it Xinji Biao Zhi Wu, acute myocardial infarction, Xing Xinji Geng Si, heart failure, Xin Li Shui Jie, CK, Ji Shuan Ji Mei, CKMB, Ji Shuan Ji Mei Tong Gong Mei, LDH, Bu Shuan Tuo Qing Mei, Chopnings, Ji Gai Dan Bai, Myoglobin, Ji Hong Dan Bai, BNP, Nao Li Na Tai. That's all for today's lesson. Thank you.